welcome to tonight's tale, the Fairy Tale Theater podcast. I'm your host, Emily. I'm joined by my two co-hosts this week, Eric and Melina. I'm Eric from New York. Hi, I'm Melina from Nunavut. Tonight, we are going to be recapping and reviewing the episode, The Dancing Princesses, which was always one of my personal favorite episodes. I'm very happy that Melina is going to be joining us this week. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Always happy to see you. (laughs) Before we do the rewatch, what are the first things we remember? Leslie and Warren's just so cute in this. I I just love her. I love... I actually really like Peter Weller, even though he's kind of quirky and weird. He works out really well. I just feel like, I don't know, just such a sweet... That's why it's probably in my top five favorite episodes, because you just... It makes you just feel good. It's just like an awe. That's so well said. I completely agree. I... Loved it as a kid because it was so romantic. For me, I also, the first thing I thought of was the music, actually. I always thought this had one of the prettiest themes of all the episodes. It was my ringtone for a while. (laughs) And I agree with you, Leslie Ann Warren and Peter Weller, they had some real chemistry, those two. The cast stands out to me from the leads to We've got Ian Abercrombie's Cobbler, Zelda Rubinstein as the old woman. We've got Sachi Parker and Roy Daughtry. So it was just a very cool ensemble piece. Melina, what do you remember? I remembered the music as well was something that stood out to me. And also I remember as a kid really liking how he wasn't a prince and how he was, yeah, and how he was a soldier instead of a prince because you always see Prince Charming. And so it was kind of like, oh, this is cool. This is different. And I remember really liking the costumes when I was a kid too. Oh, you're right. Yeah. And the costumes are really pretty. Clearly very 1840s. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. But you're right. It's kind of a backward Cinderella because he gets the beautiful princess in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the costumes being very cool. Each princess seemed to have her own color pattern, which worked. Except for the twins that always (laughs) Yeah, the twins. (laughs) I've got a couple notes about the twins. (laughs) How familiar are you with the source material, the original tale? Do you have an opinion on its faithfulness? Eric, have you read the original tale, either the English or the German version? I remember reading it when I was a lot younger, and I believe it's 12 princesses instead of Mm -hmm. six. Yes. That was the only big difference that stood out for me. I think the episode pretty much followed it very well, I think. As far as I can remember, because it's been a while, but that was the big glaring difference that stood out for me. And I understand why they would do it so that you have more character development and you have less princesses to kind of, I guess, meet and get to know. actresses to pay. (laughs) That as well. And clothes and fit into exactly. shots. Yeah. And to fit in that little bedroom where they're all up against the wall. Yeah, exactly. Sleeping. I think everyone agrees the cut from 12 princesses to six made perfect sense. Melina, I think you brushed up on the German version. I did. So in the German one, it is 12 as well. And again, like they did stay fairly true to the original story with like the shoes being danced out every night and like some other small details, even with the youngest sister noticing things are going wrong. Yeah, they stayed super true. Obviously, some of the darker stuff that's in the original one was cut out, like the princes that couldn't solve the mystery. It was off with their head. So obviously we had to make it PG. (laughs) But other than that, it's very, very faithful. That's interesting. And it was kind of how I remembered it too. Now I brushed up on the British version. I read the Andrew Lang. I always call it the English version, but Andrew Lang, I believe was Scottish. And he published his version around the Victorian era in the Red Fairy Tale book. And I was surprised at how different it was. There were still some aspects I picked up. What happened to the suitors who didn't figure it out is a big one I'll talk about later. But there's a lot of differences. In the British version, it kind of starts with the story of, well, he's not a soldier in the British version. I think he's a cow herder, like a shepherd. And then he becomes a gardener and it's his job to give flowers to the princesses every morning. And he falls in love with the youngest princess. So that's where we saw the big character development of the youngest. 
which I think fairy tale theater did a good job of really, they developed the oldest and the youngest because that kind of makes perfect sense. They're giving equal screen time because in each version, one of them is the main heroine. So I kind of liked that. Any personal memories or associations you have with this? Something that stood out for you when you first watched it as a kid? I remember the scenes where they're at the underground palace and dancing. I remember liking almost that like purple fog or mist that they put as a border almost around those scenes. I remember really liking that because it looks like a dream. Just they made it look very hazy and like a dreamlike state. And I remember really liking that as a kid. And then... (laughs) I also remember as an adult later on watching Poltergeist and then being like, yes! Wait a minute. I've seen I've seen her somewhere before. I've seen her somewhere no, before. No. I know I have. She's the got voice, even that the I voice very, it away. Yeah, she's got a very memorable voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I was like, oh my God. <laughs> That's what it is. I had the exact same experience. I'm going, I know, I know that voice from somewhere. <laughs> and then, of course, Beatrice Strait was in Princess and the Peace. Yes, so we have two was. Poltergeist stars. That's true. And Craig T. Nelson, who was in Canon Movie Tales. See, Poltergeist, we've got a lot of connections to. <laughs> Eric, any specific memories or associations that you remember? I guess I love, I like I said, I love the casting. I love, I love Leslie Ann Warren because I grew up watching Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella. So she got to play a princess again. And Peter Weller, like I said, I, I really, he was quirky and weird, but like it kind of worked. And then Roy Dotry says that the king, I love, I love him. Oh, so good. We miss him. <laughs> like, I feel like when he asks about the slippers, it always stands out for me because I remember it from the Playhouse video preview. Yes, it was. They used that. Like when he always does video. that, and he holds them up. It always I like, oh my God, that's them. the part. With all the gasps behind it. Eric, can you give me a little background on the episode? So it is episode 27, the series finale, the very last episode of Fairy Tale theater it aired on november 18th 1987 and it was directed by peter medak writer was Meredith mary edith Burrell. yeah and mary edith Burrell. and we see her on screen because she played the beggar woman in thumbelina uh, the one who gives the seed the seed in the beginning Mm -hmm. Yes, that's our screenwriter for this episode. In my opinion, she did an absolutely beautiful job. Yes, love it. So you're right. This was the series finale. I had forgotten that. And I think they went out on a very high note. I think this is one of the best episodes they did. I agree with that. (laughs) Thank you. Here, here. We start with Shelly doing a beautiful intro. Hello, I'm Shelly Duvall. Welcome to Fairy Tale Theater. Join us for tonight's tale about a wandering soldier who shows a king and his daughters that one man's problem is another's good fortune. The Dancing Princesses. And I think she's wearing one of the dresses from the ending scene. She looks so cute in that intro. She does. I so. Always With her little cute, short though. hair. Oh, that's her right. Hair. She's like really cute. We should mention Shelly's hair in every episode because she has a different do in every single. <laughs> it's true. I remember as a kid, as a child, my favorite period was the blonde phase. But now I'm like, I don't know, man. Yeah. I remember when she had the long curls. I remember when she had the little blonde updo and here she's got the short brunette look going on with like a pixie cut. Hey, good for her. (laughs) We start the episode, we get that beautiful theme music and it opens with a pillow fight between the princesses and a beautiful narration by Roy Daughtry's kind of introducing himself and saying, these are all my daughters. And they're having a pillow fight with feathers everywhere. The king interrupts. And I notice he doesn't say a word about feathers everywhere. Obviously a huge pillow fight. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't even blink. Apparently this is an everyday occurrence at this house. (laughs) Must be nice to be a princess. It must be. Then we get him walking in and we get the introductions of all six princesses. All the princesses with all the names that rhyme. (laughs) Yeah, Janetta. Yeah, that was clever, actually. All I remember is Janetta and Loretta. That's all I remember. Wait, I think even I even though it. I just watched it last night. I think I can do it. I think I can do it. I think it's Janetta, Winetta, Musetta, Coretta, Janetta, and Loretta. Good job. Janetta, Janetta, Coretta, Janetta are the are the twins, right? 
Right. That is Mm. probably the most useless talent I have, but there you go. (laughs) And Loretta's the little baby one. Yes, Loretta. Yeah. Yeah, Loretta was played by Sachi Parker. She's the blonde. Yeah, she did a beautiful job to people who might not recognize her name. She is Shirley MacLaine's daughter. And oh, she sounds exactly like her the way she she speaks. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Once (laughs) once you know it, you can see it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. She seems like a very interesting lady. I'd, I'd love to talk to her sometime. She wrote a book about her childhood, which sounded very colorful. Is that a good word? <laughs> yes. I think she did a lovely job here. She kind of got out of acting. I know she had a small part in Back to the Future. I randomly remember her there. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, tiny part. I think her line was, that's George McFly. <laughs> <laughs> so but also what I love about when the king comes in, when he walks through that door immediately, the princesses are like, oh, shit. So it's like automatically they like are almost afraid, they like not line afraid, up. but like, they line up. yeah, yeah. Like, what is this? The sound of music? They like get in line. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely true. I hadn't thought of it, but you're right. Yes, I father. Love- yes, father. <laughs> yeah, they- yes, father. And then the double kisses, very European. <laughs> true, but they still got feathers everywhere. <laughs> They're keeping a completely no. straight face. Apparently he's not concerned about that at all. <laughs> no, I think he played it like, oh, they're doing that again this week. Okay. <laughs> right. He's asking um, them about all their hobbies and how they're doing. How are your studies going, Janetta? Very well, Father. And your pity point, Winetta? I'm almost finished, Father. And your roses, Musetta? I'm melting, Father. Did you ride today, Coretta Danetta? Yes, thank you, Father. And what did you do today, my little Loretta? Oh, today was simply marvelous and then he's in his office (laughs) getting mad about bills and clearly this is based in france because they say franks that's france right (laughs) okay okay yeah could be switzerland to be fair (laughs) oh that's true it's true Yeah, because they could be going off the german version right oh very true I got a question back when they're doing the lineup and we meet Janetta and it's kind of a typical introduction. We meet Winetta. We meet Musetta. She's the one with the really long hair. We find out she's the botanist and he's asking about her roses. I have been wondering this since 1987. What was her line? He goes, roses, Musetta. Does she say I'm molting? What is she saying? I've never gotten that line and I've wondered about it for 30 years. She's like, I'm I melting think- them. I'm melting them. What is she saying? <laughs> it almost sounded like I'm melting them, but uh. right. I mean, you could melt them in water to make rose water, which makes sense because rose water is like really good for your hair. So that's kind of funny. And or you can make it into oil or you can also just dry them out and use them for other things. So that's probably what she but- meant. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think this has been bothering me for 30 years. Someone help me. <laughs> That's so funny. (laughs) Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. She's probably making rose water. I like that. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. I don't know if that's canon, but that's my. (laughs) We'll go with it. We'll go with it. And then they say their prayers. And I remember. That's right. We see all the sisters come up and this is an interesting way to say your bedtime prayers I have to admit but I remember stealing Sachi Parker's line when I was a kid and my parents would make me say my prayers and I didn't want to so I just used Sachi Parker's line which was God bless everybody and everything everywhere covered yeah, everything let's make it short and sweet covered everything covered all your bases there <laughs> Hey, it worked. We got true prayer time in half the time. (laughs) Efficiency. There we go. And it was all inspired by Loretta. Yes, it was. And then she had that (laughs) cool little tiara she put on, which looked very good. When they take off their like sleep caps. And she's got her bun underneath. (laughs) She's got a bun. Yeah, she's got an updo. It's not comfortable to sleep in, man. (laughs) Well, she clearly wasn't planning on sleeping. Hmm. I'd argue that that kind of makes sense, that they would have done their hair ahead of time. That's true. And just it under the caps that actually makes sense let's go back let's go back to a day where we snuck out of the house yes we would be completely dressed and ready to go hiding under those sheets that is completely <laughs> and true. Then when it was safe <laughs> <laughs> we'd put off the lipstick until last because the parents could spot that but 
<laughs> exactly. So, yeah. True. What, Eric, you never snuck out of the house as a kid? Yeah, of course I did. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> I have a question though. Okay. Is Janetta the only one that's studying to like do something? Is she the only one they're finishing to become someone's wife? Because she's the only one that has studies. That's, you notice that? Well, they all have different Maybe it's because she's... Yeah. Or maybe it's because she's the oldest. So it's expected. I'd say both probably as the eldest, she was probably expected that whoever she married would become King. Yeah. So she was probably prepping for that. And then you kind of get she, him. She didn't have any of these sad, not sad, but just like petty hobbies, like gardening, needle embroidery. Point. Yeah. That's you know, like she like is actually studying and learning things about the world and about things in general. I kind of interpreted it as she's like Belle from Beauty and the Beast. She's just bookish by nature. Yeah. I mean, that could also be that as the eldest, she was probably prepping. She was being groomed. Yeah. And the others... I mean, only one of them would marry the future king. So the others, well, I'm sorry, we're being trained to be arm candy. So, you know, let them garden, let them play checkers, let them. <laughs> Historically accurate. <laughs> Checker. Historically accurate. Check Go with it. <laughs> okay. I when... mean, they do later on play checkers though, when it turns into like the bachelor. I know. <laughs> God, it turns into the bachelor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> In the next scene, we have the king throwing bills in the air. <laughs> bills, 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 nothing but bills. 500 francs for oranges, they're going to squeeze me dry. And this, 2,000 francs for muskets, a has been a, a shot fired in this kingdom for years. They can see a king coming a mile away. And well, I don't believe this. Just, just read that for me, would you? Now, don't tremble, man. Just read. Five five thousand four hundred francs for shoes. shoes, highway robbery. Some of our listeners might not be aware, but I am an accountant, and I'm just writing down that is not an efficient method of record keeping. I mean, that's not what you the do. When you everywhere. Get... The accountant in me is going crazy with him throwing bills in the air. <laughs> I get where he's coming from. Wave him like you just don't care. They were probably organized by date and probably all, I mean, the royal accountant is probably tearing his hair out at that king, but that's such an Emily observation, but it got the point across. He's throwing all the bills in the air because he's being taxed everywhere. And then one thing comes to his attention and that's the bill from the royal cobbler. And how could anyone possibly run up that high of a bill for shoes. Yeah, I got six daughters, but this seems ridiculous just for shoes, which is a good point. And so he says, send the royal cobbler to me, who miraculously seemed to be just outside. And we get the arrival of the great Ian Abercrombie playing the cobbler, who is just adorable. Any of you, am, am I the only one that just loved him so much for this role? Six new pairs of down slippers every day for the past month. That's 12 new shoes per day at 30 francs a pair, or 15 francs a piece. Whichever way you look at it, the total cost comes to 5,400 francs, precisely. He's very cute. I like him in this role. He's so cute. He's and he's so... like, yep, according to my records, and I love that he's like adding it up. So it's so <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> he actually looks like an accountant. He's got his books. He's got them all in order. He's not throwing his papers around the room. He's got it all in order. Good for him. Good record <laughs> keeper. And so he's able to back up his numbers. So the king's going, all right, something fishy's going on. He and the cobbler go down the hallway and they see the worn out dance slippers, just like the cobbler predicted. And he's going, all right, there's something that kosher going on here. So he bangs on the door and it's apparently much earlier than he usually wakes his daughters up because they're still soaking their feet. And he knocks and goes, everybody decent. And like Melina said, they all suddenly assemble like sound of music <laughs> for inspection. Every time. That's when the father, Roy Dotrice, he's in the famous pro mode segment of the episode. I demand to know why these dance slippers are worn through. Mm. Because apparently they leave them outside every night when they're worn out. Right. That's what the cobbler told him to go check out. And he went right up there to go check out. And like he said, all six of them were sitting outside of the door, all worn out and dirty and gross. And 
the girls are sitting there soaking their feet in little tubs. So cute. Because they were dancing all night and their feet hurt now. Well, mine would. And- I'll say this, and Melina, I, I'd be interested on your perspective too. We, we've we worn dancing shoes, I'm sure, female dancing shoes. I've gone to plenty of dances. I've never danced so long that my shoes literally fell apart. That's never happened to me. Has it happened to you? No, it hasn't. I don't think I've done that I to a pair of shoes. you go I think through a most... pair of shoes every night? Yeah. That's, every that's night. Wild. I've never gone That's through something else in one night. I mean, <laughs> one pair. Of sh- it's never happened to me. I did read. And they weren't even heels. They were ballet flats. That's true. I know in one version of the tale, and I love this. It was actually one princess who went through 12 pairs of shoes a night. Dang, girl. <laughs> she was stomping it out. Yeah. I mean, that's she did a lot of Macarena's that night. So we see <laughs> we see uh, Leslie Ann Warren doing a pretty credible impression of Roy Daughtrys as she confronts the cobbler. I can't imagine why our slippers are wearing out so quickly, Father. <laughs> and she's trying to pin it all on the cobbler like he just does this shoddy of work. That's why they're falling apart, which you think about it, that's kind of a rotten thing to do. He's a hardworking tradesman. He keeps good books. He's working very hard to keep her in new shoes. And she throws him under the bus. <laughs> That's pretty rotten, Janetta. Rude. To give her credit, she does shift gears pretty quickly and turns it to like, I'm a daddy's girl and our feet must be tearing them as they grow. Like that's a thing. Nobody's feet grow so fast that they tear out shoes each and every day. But Bravo for creativity. I'll give her that. And then does he, does he come up there and then? I think he does come up there and then with the plan, how he's going to find out, right? Yeah, he does. They all kind of circle together and do, I wrote this down. They do a football huddle. They, the girls all do a little football huddle while they whisper to each other. He goes and talks to the cobbler and then he shouts out, I'm going, this is so football. He goes, right. Since you all refuse to explain this expensive Mystery, perhaps I should search my kingdom for willing detectives. (laughs) And then he comes up with the plan. And the plan is that he's going to put it out there for someone to solve the mystery of the dancing princesses, where they go every night. And if they can figure it out in three nights time, then they can choose one of the princesses to marry and ultimately, you know, become the next in line for the throne and all that. That's right. And then the girls are very much appalled at this idea. What do you mean? You're I mean, wouldn't you be? I mean, I would be. Wouldn't you be? I'd probably look like Sachi Parker with my jaw on the floor going, wait, you're going to marry me off to some random guy who can figure out a mystery about my footwear. That's weird. That's weird, dad. That's weird, dad, even for you. But I guess 5,000 francs a month is a lot. So we need to figure this shit out. You know... I'm very close with my dad. Anyone who follows me on Facebook knows that. And I've run up some credit card bills in my day. He's never threatened to marry me off to save money, (laughs) to my knowledge. That's funny. Okay. Loretta says she's too young to get married and her older sister gets condescending and agrees with her. And that struck me as a very sisterly moment. Well, this is a fine kettle of fish. Now what are we going to do? Whoever thought our shoes would give us away? Well, I'm too young to get married. What makes you think a prince would pick you anyway? I would so do that to my little sister. And we finally see Leslie Ann being Leslie Ann. I, for one, will be no prince's door prize. Let them cozy up to father. (gasps) Not one of them will discover our secret. (laughs) I have a plan. (laughs) I wrote down, I'm going, this is the moment where I realized she's the star of the episode because she's clearly the ringleader. She gathers everyone together. She's like, none of us is going to get married. I have a plan. And all her sisters clearly listen to her. And I went, okay, this is where I got that she's the lead. And she's like a timeless princess. We have to remember this is like literally 20 years after Cinderella. 
That's and true. she aged that much? Not really. <laughs> no, she was only 19 when she did Cinderella as well. Like she was so, so little. Yeah. So she would have been in her late 30s, early 40s when she did this. And this was shortly after Miss Scarlet and Clue. Oh, the best. Oh, that is the best. <laughs> that is so our generation. <laughs> Everyone loves Well, yours, not mine. I wasn't born yet. But oh, shish. <laughs> we all grew up watching Clue. But yes. Free slumber party. So good. Madeline Kahn with her flames out the side of my face. On the side of my face. (laughs) (laughs) Iconic. Of course, Leslie Ann Warren, one plus two plus two plus one plus. (laughs) We've got the entrance of Peter Weller next. He looks like so disheveled. They did a good job of making him look like he's seen some shit when he first comes on screen. (laughs) Well said. (laughs) He has seen Thanks. some shit. Yes. <laughs> and he and he's in like those like bright in red, shit. literally. And he's got those like bright red, like nutcracker esque pants on. <laughs> I mean, I think they make him look like a nutcracker, <laughs> just because they're the like so. Pants. You're right. Yes, that mustache. I had trouble getting over that mustache. Like practically goes down to his shoulders. <laughs> that was a lot. Was it real? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. But you're right. Oh. You believe that this guy got out of a war and he's been sleeping in sheds and just kind of wandering around. And sitting there chilling, eating a turnip. Yeah. That turnip. Like a raw freaking turnip, just like with a knife. Like, hey, what's up? <laughs> just me and my turnip. <laughs> like it's. <laughs> what? You don't do that? You you don't no. just hang out and eat raw turnip and go, what was up? No, turnip, no. Radishes, yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. I wrote down the same thing. I'm going, what is with the turnip? <laughs> right? Just a man with his turnip. I do like how they did kind of, it's funny because from the neck up, he kind of looks like disheveled, but then from like everything else down, he has that random like bandana scarf green thing on. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Like, was he wounded or is that a sweatband? Is he just or- trying to be thug? They did say like Cinderella, like dirty makeup on his cheeks. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. Like they did for Jennifer Beals. <laughs> You're right. But I was going, okay, so that bandana around his forehead, was he wounded? Is that a sweatband or was that just the 1980s and it looked cool kind of thing? Probably that. I think maybe it was more of a fashion statement yeah, to make I th- him I look think it cool was... and mysterious. That like mullet-esque, <laughs> like let's get physical hair. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, let's get physical. I went Vic Tannies, but yeah, I'm, I'm like, that just strikes me as a very 80s kind of accessory. And I love that Zelda Rubenstein, she's like, wow, that's a really hearty meal for a soldier, like a turnip. Like she oh cracks on God. his meal. Yes. <laughs> and then she does like the equivalent of what's a pretty girl like you doing in a place like this. Tell me, soldier, what's a warrior like you doing in a peaceful kingdom like this? <laughs> bless her yeah. and she sold it she completely sold it she said it's so natural i just i'm going hey my hat off to you zelda <laughs> it's true her costume is really cute too it is i really i remember liking her hat as a child oh <laughs> it was a statement piece i'll give you that mm-hmm. for her scene being so like small no pun intended <laughs> um <laughs> it's it's just <laughs> like <On you>. memorable <laughs> It's memorable. Shame on you, Melissa. <laughs> I'm a small one man's person. Witch. I'm really short too. One man's witch is another's good fairy. Right. But actually, Melina, I know what you're saying. It, she's in one scene. One it's scene, so memorable. But she's incredibly memorable to a point where you and I, years later, we're watching Poltergeist and we go, I know her. <laughs> yes. She's got a very memorable oh, the voice. presence and voice. But Carol Ann. God. <laughs> I didn't need to sleep tonight, Eric. Thank you. (laughs) But it's true. It's not just how memorable she is with her voice and everything. She took a very tiny part. I mean, she probably only worked one day. And yet we all remember her very vividly in this role. So kudos to her. She did a beautiful job. She did. I also love how she wants to help him out immediately. I wrote this down during my rewatch. I'm going, I think she's got a crush on him. (laughs) It is very flirtatious. (laughs) Thank you. I'm like, not going to lie. There was something about him. It, it was good. Agreed. Completely. <laughs> Completely. 
I can't put my finger on it, but it was something. <laughs> yeah. Although what I didn't care for was him calling her old woman. Ah! He answers to it. <laughs> I know. It doesn't even correct him. It's just like, okay, I think you're cute. So I'll acknowledge this. I looked it up. I think she was like 51 when she made this. Now, granted, I'm getting older. So my position of what an old woman is keeps getting further and further away from me. But she's like 51 and she's always had a very childlike face. And he just calls her old woman and she just turns around. <laughs> but that's literally what she's listed as on the episode, the old woman. I know if I were her, I would have had a word with my agent about that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel for you, Zelda. You didn't deserve that. <laughs> not the beggar woman, not the peddler. Yeah, the I would have been fine. just old. I would have been fine with peddler, or you know, you could have taken, given her one line and said, "My name is Zelda." I, I just old woman. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible. Then we get the introduction of the invisible cloak. So this is how he gets it right. He gives her, he offers her a bit of kindness. He offers her a piece of his, I wouldn't want it, a piece of his raw turnip, sorry. No, thank you. But he offers her a piece. She like nibbles on it. She spits the rest of it out. (laughs) When she gives her the gold (laughs) coin, she like, she's like. (laughs) I did not notice that. I died. That was so funny. How did I not notice that? That's great. So she's like, here, would you like a piece? She's like, sure. And she starts nibbling on it. She says, you know, if you could help me out, I would be much appreciated. So he pulls out a gold coin, he gives it to her. And so she spits oh, it out so she can, you know. Just the metal. You're right. Test it yeah. to see if it's a real coin. I died. Very fun. I hadn't caught that. You're right. And because he offered so much kindness to her, being that he had nothing, he just came out of war. He's looking rough. She was like, well, I'm going to help you out. This is going on with the princesses. And this is, and he, she explains it all to him. She's like. The king is looking for who can solve the mystery of the dancing princesses. She, she's the first to use the phrase dancing princesses. Yes. All anyone knows is the shoes are worn out, but no one knows why. And she calls them the, the dancing princesses. And he goes, so the king's darlings go dancing at night. And then you kind of see her go, ooh, said too much. All right. She backs away. Gotta and- go. And she Bye. helps him out a lot. She tells him all of that. And she gives him the cloak. Yeah. She goes, this can help you. It makes whoever's going to wear it invisible. And she also tells him, When you get to the palace, don't drink the wine. Yeah, well, we find out later on why he shouldn't drink the wine, so I won't spoil it. But I mean, she gives it all to him. Like, here you are. This is what you need to succeed. Here it all is for you. And it was all because he shared his turnip. Let that be a lesson to all of us. (laughs) Share our turnips. (laughs) <laughs> I, I love how he turns around and then there's clearly a poster like right there <laughs> about yeah. what's going on he's and like he I, gotta, will- I gotta find this palace and then he like rolls up the poster and it's like you didn't look on the poster first to see if, if there was an address you're just gonna randomly wander around until you find the palace he looks at the poster and he says i'll take a good fairy over an old witch any day and i remember going is that on the poster because <laughs> it looks like he's reading it from the poster and I didn't realize he was talking to himself and like looking at the details but it was just a weird delivery I remember thinking as a kid does the poster say I'll take a good ferry over an old witch any day is that what it says I thought it was about the king's offer <laughs> I, I'm sorry Peter Weller I didn't like how you did that part but presumably there was an address on well, I don't know. Did they need an address? It was the king. So you just head for like the pointy castle, right? Fair enough. That's true. We have the arrival of Prince Heinrich from Upper Winbach, who oh is- Oh my God, he's hilarious. Oh, he's delightful. That was played by the late, great Max Wright, who we miss very much. He's a fellow Michigander. So of course I love him. Again, my generation. I remember him as Alf's dad. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) I never watched Alf regular, but I remember that he was the dad on Alf. So there I am officially an eighties girl, but yeah. So we have Max Wright coming in and he is just eating up this part with a spoon. He is having a ball. Now I see here that you come from upper Winbow. Yes, we severed from Lower Winbow after the Watercress Wars. The best families went upper and the worst went lower, naturally. 
Au next. So what happens is we get the introduction of the prince and God, Max Wright is such a good sport. He's wearing all this lavender and lace and he is- All like bedazzled jewels all over the cravat. Yeah, he's got like rhinestones and (laughs) good for him. And yeah, the princesses come in and they're introduced and they're a little catty. They're a little mean girls. He looks like an Easter egg. (laughs) Every day's a holiday and a pa (laughs) windmill. Because they're making fun of him within earshot. (laughs) I mean, granted, their observations were spot on. But still, didn't their daddy teach him to have better manners than that? At least wait till someone leaves the room. Yeah, I've I've got a couple criticisms throughout going, girls are really spoiled. (laughs) They're kind of catty. They're making fun of people who are working hard for a living. They're, well, probably realistic princesses of that era. (laughs) This was what I was referring to earlier, and it's a a major departure from the different versions of the fairy tale, and it's what happened to the other suitors. Because from what I remember, and I think what you said, Melina, they're executed if they can't figure out the princess's secret, right? Oh, yeah. But whoever tried and did not succeed after three days and nights should be put to death, (laughs) is is what it says (laughs) on the text in front of me. Yeah, it's a common trope in the German fairy tales. If you can't do it, you die. Like all these crowned heads of Europe just had all these sons that were expendable. (laughs) Anyway, in the British version, this is extremely different because the princes who tried, they just disappeared. And then you find out later what happened was the princesses were drugging them and the drug took away all of their memories and all of their loves, except for their love of dancing. And they became the partners in the underground castle for them to dance with. The men, the girls were dancing with were the suitors who did not succeed. Ew, that's creepy. Yeah. so creepy. That's like date rapey. Like they captured them. It was like some like trafficking, trafficking to their underground dancing worlds. (laughs) No, it's true. And I'm maybe you see why I'm going, why I got a lot of criticisms for the princesses this time around. I'm like, that's awful. I mean, to be fair, they didn't put them to death. But I think that's worse. (laughs) Anyway, my, my point is that that was a very big deviation amongst the fairy tales that I noticed. That's. And it kind of makes sense because I remember when I say makes sense, I mean, in terms of plot device, not in terms of what is right with the world. It makes sense plot wise, because I always kind of wondered who were these nameless guys that they were dancing with and what happened to them? Because it's not ever explained in the fairy tale theater version. They just live under Loretta's bed. Yeah. Well, I had a cat that uh, did that. (laughs) So I thought that was an interesting difference between the versions of the fairy tale. I mean, I will say this, if it makes you feel a little better about the princesses, once the spell is broken, the other princes were freed from their curse as well. So they were rescued too. Our next scene is the cobbler's shop. So the soldier apparently has like some problem with his boot. So he goes to the cobbler's shop. At this point, he goes to fix the boot. And I think it's like a two-fold kind of thing. He's like, oh, let me also like find out what's going on with get more intel on this situation with the princesses and where the yeah. castle is. Let me try to find a local's take on well, things here. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because he just wandered into the cobbler shop because of his boot. He didn't realize it was the royal cobbler. And then he's going, oh... So you can get me in. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, these are supposed to go to the castle. These are slippers for the princess. He's like, oh, great. I'm going there too. Maybe you can take me there. And Cobbler doesn't like that idea at all. (laughs) I mean, would you? You look rough. I can't blame him. He's probably- I don't want to vouch for you. You're looking like a hot mess. No, thank you. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, he also doesn't (laughs) know him. Exactly. He's like, I wouldn't take some random guy off the street to my most important client. No, I wouldn't. And so he basically (laughs) tells him, oh, you know, take me. I'm going to try to be, you know, the next person that can try to solve this mystery of princesses. And he's like, oh, so many have tried before. He's like, well, I'm going to do it this time, you know, Mm -hmm. because I have this and shows him the cloak. And then it's like, 
my first order of business when I become king is that you'll you'll have a title. You'll be Sir Royal Cobbler. He's like, oh, sir. Like yeah, really Lord Cobbler. And I wrote down Lord Cobbler. Yeah, I'm going Sir Royal Cobbler. <laughs> yeah, Sir Cobbler. He's like, eh, Lord Cobbler. He likes that. I lived in the United Kingdom for a while. That's not how titles work. <laughs> you don't get okay. a title based on your profession. Your yeah. title is in your name. Name, yeah. Like, but he doesn't have a name. His name is Cobbler. So. Uh, apparently. <laughs> lord Cobbler. And he's just so easily persuaded by the idea of being a lord. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will play devil's advocate a tiny bit way, way, way back in the day when last names first became a thing. In the British Isles, people took their profession as their last name. That's how you get the surnames Smith and Taylor and Baker. The, those are all British surnames. They took their profession. So maybe Lord Cobbler could kind of work. There's your useless trivia for the day. There it is. <laughs> okay. So we have them arriving at the gates of the palace. And I wrote down that the cobbler made the ugliest pairs of shoes I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, what was that like nude patent leather? Yeah, it, it was like gray or brown patent leather with really loud bows. And then I went, I should go easy on the cobbler. He's had to come up with new patterns of shoes every day for like a year. But they didn't look anything like the cute ones that were all worn out with the ribbons and with the... <laughs> He's probably tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> The next scene is the king and Janetta, and they're getting a rather interesting history lesson. Oh, right. Yeah. What exactly is the history lesson again? I forget. There's something about the oceans receded. Down. Yeah. What were they talking about there? I don't know. It makes no sense. You see, when the great waters receded, the earth was left dry and the kingdoms were created. But kingdoms are made by men, father, not dry spells. No. Um, we are here, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, if what you say is true, then our kingdom should be bordered by two oceans. Yes, you have a point. <laughs> and even Janetta calls him out going, that makes no sense. Yeah, it's very odd. But then he like compliments her. He's like, I always love how you're so inquisitive, Janetta. You're always thinking. You're always like, he's like complimenting her, right? No, you're he's right. Kind of like, he goes, you are so clever. And I wrote yeah, down. Yeah, he says you're so clever, my Janetta. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote down, Daddy's girl. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, if we didn't know who the favorite was before, we know who it is now. She's not only the favorite; she's the freaking lit- ringleader of this whole operation. True. You know, she's the ringleader of drugging the guys. She's the ringleader of taking them down into that underworld. She clearly stands out as the lead of the girls. Like you know right away, like she's the one to look at. It. You're being kind, that. calling her ringleader. I would say mastermind, but <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the point stands. So then we move forward from there. Um, the arrival of the soldier. The soldier arrives. At this point, they've had many suitors come forward to try to solve the mystery of the dancing princesses at this point, right? Right, because the trumpets sound and she goes, oh, not another prince, not another one. I'm getting... Short on my magic potion supplies, dad. But I feel like she, when he walks in, she's like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. She woke up and paid attention when he (laughs) came in. (laughs) Oh, hey. (laughs) She's like, oh, this is Give him a chance, daddy. You know, give him a chance. Well, we've had so many people. We're done. No, I I think you should try. I think he could do this. He doesn't look like an Easter egg. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I like this one. Let him try (laughs) I know she's really rooting for him to be allowed because at first the king's going, it's only open to princes. And I went, well, you should have put that in your proclamation. But Janetta's bringing up a good point. Why? Why is it only open to princes? This guy's gorgeous and he doesn't look like an Easter egg. And I love his dreamy handlebar mustache. (laughs) Yeah. You could tell she was really digging him. She was totally into the soldier. Now, she didn't really... I was thinking about this. I'm like, I don't think she actually saw him as a potential husband. She was just going, well, he'd be pretty eye candy to have around the castle for three days. Yeah. And this one could be fun to play around with. That was how I took it. Yeah. Too funny. So he agrees and he's going to try. First, we get kind of a little flirty moment. 
between oh, okay. Netta yeah, and the soldier. She compliments his manners. Yes. And he had a line that I wrote down. If a guy said this to me on a date, I would have shot him down and walked out. He goes, most women of your age are already married. Dude. Oh, sister. He is. <laughs> he totally is. I, oh, like, no. I, I would have walked out, been out of the restaurant and in my car at that point. <laughs> How did she let him get away with that one? She That's saw it as funny. a challenge. Uh, <laughs> like I was ticked. <laughs> she plays it like there's more to life than romance. And I went, sure, Janetta, you don't fool me. I saw the way you were checking out that not romance guy. <laughs> Then we get the king and the soldier walking down the hallway, swapping manly war stories, I guess. Smoking cigars, talking war, being men. Arg. Yeah. The cute reoccurring gag of the random guy that keeps climbing a ladder trying to get into the palace. Or spy or whatever he's doing. Oh, pretty sure he was trying to see the princesses naked. I I think that was kind of his goal. (laughs) <laughs> peeping tom i think so that's why the king's just used to him and just throws him doesn't think twice about him falling several floors he's used to him the guards will catch him he'll be back we're used to it we've done this drill and then Janetta appears with the cookies and milk she looks Is that because he didn't eat at dinner he didn't yeah. drink the wine at dinner Yeah, Roy Daughtry's narration explains that he'd followed the old woman's advice, the old woman again. He'd followed the mysterious 50-something-year-old woman's advice (laughs) and avoided the wine at dinner. But Janetta, of course, noticed. So she comes back with a plan B, which is... To try to roofie him again. Yeah. So she's... (laughs) Her and her date rape drugs, I'm getting a little uncomfortable about, but... (laughs) <laughs> so she comes back with the cookies and milk but he's on to that he distracts her by going is that your father in the window <laughs> which worked perfectly actually so if he- she were smart enough she would have laced the cookies too because he ate the cookies remember he ate yes. the cookies yeah he threw out the milk yeah if she Are was smart enough she would have laced everything she knows how to bake cookies <laughs> <laughs> Those are well, at least dust, at least du- dust them in some roofie powder. <laughs> All right. Good point. Girl, be smart. <laughs> well, he got it over her because he pretended to drink the milk and she he dumped it went, in a plant. He dumped it in a plant and she went back feeling very self-satisfied. Huh. And I'm going, how is this supposed to work? How were the spy is supposed to figure out what was going on in the next room from the princesses when and i love when he's explaining this to the suitor he's like yeah so you have access to their room so you can figure out what they're doing and, and no hanky panky <laughs> i'm like oh no so no sexual assault guys <laughs> yeah i mean there's so many innuendos here there's no hanky panky there's a guy trying to climb and get into the princess's bedroom there's uh but really they could assault him because they drugged him they go assault yeah, him yeah. in his room True. <laughs> they can go the jump up on that turned. that's what i said i'm like <laughs> i'm getting uncomfortable about this guys <laughs> <laughs> and there's six of them exactly <laughs> So anyways, without going it's, too dark. It's a lot. I mean, but they present it to us. They give it to us on a silver platter. We don't I have to know, like, make it up. Like literally. Just, I know. You know, that was the thing about fairy tale theater. It's not us having dirty minds. It's that they had some really dirty jokes. They did. This, this one had a lot. This one had a lot. Frog Prince had a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Eric Idle. <laughs> I love him. Anyway, moving on, we've got all the princesses getting ready for their party. And I wrote down, it reminds me of when I was in college and all of my friends and I would huddle in front of this one small mirror. Did we need to huddle and all use one mirror? No. Did we do it anyway? Yes. Because it was fun. Obviously, it was pre-COVID. We were borrowing each other's lipsticks and eyeshadows. And it was a sweet moment. And I could see six sisters of about the same age all acting like that. I loved it. And it was a beautiful shot where they managed to get all six actresses looking beautiful. No one was out of focus. I thought it was a lovely Yeah, it's shot. a great shot. It's a great shot. That's why they did it. 
because all of them probably have their own vanity, but it's just, it's so effective. Yeah. Like I said, when I was in college, we all could have had our compacts or something, but it's more fun to just all huddle together and check out while I'm putting on my eyeshadow, I can check out if Vanessa's needs more eyeliner. It, It was just something fun. We all did. It's a cute moment, though. It works. It's effective. It is, and the music is yeah. kind of getting a little more excited. Oh, you so got good. like this party vibe. The girls are get- all in like, yeah, I love how with their dresses, they're all the same style, but then the sash and like the bows are all different colors. Yeah, that's that was really sweet. Cute. Just different little accents, and each girl had. She's like, "What do you think? Color. The yellow or the pink? The yellow. The pink makes you look like a cupcake. <gasps> Thanks a lot." <laughs> <laughs> And those two actresses who play the twins, they are not related at all. In fact, I think one is from Michigan and one is from Canada. So they're not they even look the same. Like exactly alike. They're not even the same. Oh, nationality. hey. Yeah. I want to say she was from Ontario. Star Androff was her name. I, I want to say Ontario, but I'm not positive. Yeah. And I know the other one's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, because as Eric once pointed out, I know when someone's from Michigan, it's a superpower. <laughs> you do. I do. We'll watch when any Loretta random movie and, and I'll go, his second cousin twice removed is from Michigan. <laughs> so Loretta and Musetta, they both are last name Parker. They're not related, right? No, they're not. Yeah, that's just okay. a coincidence because Sachi Parker, funny. Sachi Parker played Loretta and her father was and Vivica Parker was yeah, Musetta. I, yeah, I think Steve Parker was her father and that was Shirley MacLaine's ex-husband. So no, they're not related at all. But I remember watching the credits and going, oh, two people named Parker. They must play the twins. And then I looked it up and I'm going, no, <laughs> that's neither of them at all. And the two who played the twins aren't even the same nationality, but dang, they looked alike. That was very good casting. They did a good job. But also what would have been cool is if the twins from Three Women were in this. (laughs) Oh, there you go. Uh, So I wrote down about the colors scheme. And I mean, my first instinct would have been to make them all the different colors of the rainbow, but they Mm -hmm. didn't do that. I think they were mostly pastels. We had green, pink, orange, Mm-hmm. yellow a yellow in there and musetta was in blue but it was like a light blue mm-hmm. yeah they're all pastel powdery colors which and worked. then yeah janetta's in green yeah it worked it kind of i think made it a little more delicate than doing like bright red or something and bright mm-hmm. purple then they have the little man of my dreams mm-hmm. which was very romantic. you know what's really sweet about what i love about that line so earlier today i was watching the cameo video that leslie and warren did and it was really sweet and she quoted that and she goes what i love about that line is it reminds me of my husband and i was like oh <laughs> that he's a prince among men oh my yes. gosh Stop it, Leslie Ann. (laughs) I know. It was so cute. She was like, whenever I get to play a princess. (laughs) Well, she's done it more than once. She's allowed to say that. Exactly. But I found that really cute, how she remembered that line. Anyway, so they have that sweet prince among men. (laughs) So that's how they're able to open the portals if they have to, like, say, the man of my dreams is dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Each of them have to say it part of the spell so it kind of gives you the impression that the men they're dancing with are just kind of conjured up in their imaginations as opposed to the english version of the fairy tale where the men they danced with were men that they had drugged and enslaved this version was a lot nicer (laughs) yeah they conjured them so the man of my dreams is a prince loretta's is so random can i say all of them oh go ahead (laughs) no go ahead she goes, the man of my dreams is a prince with a beard. <laughs> She's specific. You know what? The girl knows what she wants. She goes, the man of my dreams is a prince with a beard who's never bad tempered and, and loves, to, loves go to go swimming. <laughs> like, it's so what? random, but very specific. Oh my God, but it's so true. The younger you are, the more picky you are. My dad has said this to me because I'm still single. When I was... Younger, I'm like, okay, he needs to check this box and this box and this box. And now I'm more at a point going, is he alive? <laughs> <laughs> and then the man of my dreams, the prince with great courage, who wins all awards and protects little people. Oh, so the dwarves from I Snow know. White? I, how did I see that comment coming? <laughs> I swear. 
saw that coming a mile away. The man of my dreams is a prince and a sailor who travels the oceans and never gets sick. Like, what are these? So, Treat Williams? Like, I'm sorry. Oh, what? yeah, that would make sense. We had our sailor okay. prince. Maybe in so. Way. Okay, so now we're we're touching on Snow White and Little Mermaid. Okay, here we go. The man of my dreams is a prince and a poet who is very romantic and dances divine. Hmm. Who would that be? A prince and poet. Well, that rolls out Chris Reeve. The man of my dreams is a prince with a heart who takes in small animals and gives to the poor. That's Chris Reeve, Mr. Oh, 100%. Yeah, that's, he that's Chris Reeve. The and poor. <laughs> And then, of course, you end with Janetta, Leslie and Warren. The man in my dreams is a prince among men. The prince and the sailor, that's got to be Treat Williams. What was the one we couldn't figure out? A poet and a dancer. Poet and a dancer. Well, we had Rex Smith, who was a singing prince. True. True. That's the best I got. (laughs) That's the best I got, too. Um, You could say Cinderella's prince, because he can dance. Oh, Oh, no, that's good. Yeah, the one who dances divinely. That, That could be... Matthew Broderick and Cinderella. I'll give you that. Yeah, very yeah, true. You can dance. I'm wondering he's if probably the only one that we've Easter seen egg, dance, or if we're just like. So I'm going to say that it's an Easter egg. You know what? Even if it wasn't, we made it one. <laughs> exactly. I wish they were like one that has a sense of humor, because then that would be that would definitely be Robin. That would be Robin. I just wrote down. I'm like, no one cares about a sense of humor because that's personally top of my list, but. <laughs> no, I, they just want someone that can swim and write poetry and someone with a beard. <laughs> I'm just thinking when I hear the beard who loves to go swimming, I'm thinking of Chris Reeves' squire in yes. Sexy Beauty. <laughs> That's exactly who I'm picturing. Oh my God, so funny. You get three fairy tale theater fans together, we can justify anything. <laughs> Find any Easter egg. <laughs> And if we can't find one, we can invent one. <laughs> so, so then after they, well, before they do that, we, we forgot to say, mention this, the girls go to check on the soldier to make sure that oh, he's yeah. fully, he's fully roofied. <laughs> <laughs> is he, is that you bitch knocked out? Mickey. Yep. <laughs> is that bitch yep. knocked out? Let's go check. And he very quickly jumps into bed and pretends to be knocked out well this goes back to what we were saying when we used to sneak out of the house and we just pull the covers over ourselves (laughs) i wrote down i was impressed at how many actors they managed to squeeze into that one shot that was seven actors in one shot and you could see all of them and they had to make sure i love that he's all make sure noshing on his cookie peering through the door i know that was cute but i'm just going Okay, there's six girls and they all want to check on the guy and make sure he's fast asleep. Now, I would imagine in real life, six girls wanting to check on one guy, they'd probably surround the bed. (laughs) But no, they all form a little pyramid (laughs) over him. And then he lets out a cute little snore, which made me laugh. And they're like, oh, shoot, maybe we shouldn't all be breathing down his neck. That might wake him up. Yeah, let's not do this. Let's not wake him up. So after they have the man of my dreams part. Oh, my favorite. Was, Love it. It was romantic. It was the music was beautiful. It was directed very carefully. Every actress got her moment to speak. To and the then camera. Janetta's most poignant line, because she's the eldest. The man of my dreams is a prince among men. She's also the star. Okay. You, yep. you give the best line to the star. <laughs> yeah. And then the mattress opens up and they go down into the cave. In the English version, it's a trap door that actually leads them outside of the palace. This isn't like a magic spell type place. They actually leave the palace and go through a wood. I mean, not an important difference, but slight difference. <laughs> And then we had that filter, Melina, that you talked about with, I think it was pink around the edges, kind of making it look a yeah, little. It's like a, yeah, it's like pinky, pinky purple. Yeah, it looks like fog or like mist, but I love how it kind of adds to the fantasy of this underground I, disco. <laughs> disco. <laughs> Now that could have been cool. That would have been a different version where they get to the dance floor and there's a disco ball and. <laughs> Like Zana do, they're all on roller skates. I love it. I would pay to see that. I would too. That would be so worth it. And you know what? I could see Leslie Ann Warren being down for it. 
<laughs> yeah, she was like, a ballerina yeah. in her youth. She was. So. I wrote that down. I'm like, yeah, she was a ballerina. She's, and you can tell she is a classically trained dancer. Good for her. But I could see oh, her being game. Always, yeah. Like, oh, roller skates, bell bottoms. Sure. I totally see her being game for it. The pink filter around the camera. I get why they did it. It does add a little atmospheric. I kind of thought it was a little dated by now, but I mean, it works. It totally worked. We have the gondolas. Now, this was straight out of the Andrew Lang version, 100%. They had the golden gondolas. They had to go across like a little lake to get to the castle. Is that in the German version? I do not remember. Yes, it is. And they also stayed really true in the episode as well because the soldier gets in the boat with the youngest. Yeah. And the, yeah. And her prince says something like, oh, I don't know why it's so heavy tonight. Yeah, politely but- saying, did you gain weight? <laughs> Like she's like it's not me yeah and the way they did it in fairy tale theater in the german version that makes sense she was the last one to get on a boat so he hopped on the last boat in the english version it was the youngest that he had a crush on he was really into so he was kind of stalking her basically the whole time so that's why he was in her boat we get a beautiful sequence of the girls dancing in the english version it is a complete castle it is a complete castle that they go to in the middle of this forest this enchanted forest that sure didn't look like a castle to me it didn't even look like a ballroom it kind of looked like a gazebo yeah it looked like the gazebo in cinderella It did. It looked exactly like Cinderella, except smaller. Cinderella had more room. And Well, rooms, but it was like in Cinderella, like we said in that episode, it's like they're running in and out of there 20 times and in and out of the same gazebo. She ran through the same ballroom like three times to make the palace look bigger. Yeah. (laughs) But Cinderella and the prince had more room to dance than these six couples got. So they were pretty tightly packed in there, but it was a beautiful montage thank you (laughs) it's a beautiful montage of the evening and you could see the different dances and all the actresses and the soldier yeah they act so cute they actually learned like the choreography too oh definitely leslie ann warren was probably just loving this i don't know she mentioned that they only learn this in a few days she said because they really you got to remember they only film these episodes in a week. Yeah, I think she said they filmed this, this in like four days. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, then I'm going to guess that most of the other actresses were dancers. They must have been. I'm yeah, because sure. how else would you get it that quickly? You know. Let me put it this like, way: the you could give me a year, and I would not be able to do any of those dances. I've got. I two have two left feet. feet. Yep. <laughs> I don't either. I cannot dance. Can you dance, Eric? Um. I think I can when I have a few drinks in me. (laughs) Well, we all think we can when we have a few drinks in us. (laughs) We've got breakfast scene is the next shot. And he's like, I'm going to play it cool. And I don't want to lead on that. They know that I know. Yeah. So they're all sitting down to breakfast. And I wrote down, all right, you're trying to do a European setting. That is a, that is the most American breakfast I've ever seen. They've got Toast and bacon and orange juice and scrambled eggs. Roy Daughtry's was probably going, really, guys? <laughs> Where's the Marmite? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but yeah. And berries and fruit. Oh. <laughs> yeah, not European at all. No croissants. Nope. No nothing. There's my coffee. But again, I love how they all fit around this table. And the twins are almost sitting on what looks like a couch. <laughs> it's oh, I- like... You're right. I didn't notice that this time, but I remember that. Yeah. So it's like, huh. But I think it's a really cool shot. I always love looking at the background when I do rewatches, but I love the set decoration and how there's that black fence behind them. And then how he just completely lies and it's like, oh, I was so tired from my journey. I just left. Uh, But then they don't even try to hide their giggles. (laughs) No, that's what I said. These princesses have no manners. (laughs) Right? They don't keep anything on the DL. No, they don't. I'm, well, I mean, to be fair, they kind of date rape a bunch of men. And <laughs> it's true. Creepy. But then after the breakfast scene, it's probably one of my favorite parts of the whole episode. What I like to call the bachelor or a shot at love, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Because it's all the girls. Oh, spending- yes. They basically all have a date with him that day. <laughs> Loretta fell for the way he played the checkers. And I should have known Winetta would weaken for any handyman who could fix her embroidery hoop. (laughs) 
Musetta? <laughs> well, she succumbed immediately to his green thumb. And Coretta and Donetta, I'm sorry to say, fought over him like two kittens with a catnip mouse. Janetta alone remained to be conquered. But then I love when it gets to Janetta and they're not really doing an activity. They're just kind of sitting there and talking. Yeah, they were but having it feels tea. Oh, that's right. They're having tea. But it feels natural. And I love the like side eye she gives him. She does. She had one great line that I wrote down and she said, Charm like beauty is too often skin deep. Don't you agree? That is a very astute observation. I think she's absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, granted, that's not the point of the conversation, but I'm going, that's probably very true. Good point, Janetta. The older I get, the more I identify with Janetta. Janetta kind of gives a little background of her father mm -hmm. and how when her mother died, father grieved for years, refused to marry. So he doesn't know what to do with six daughters. So he locks this up, which kind of makes sense. That's a little bit of background information that's kind of making the picture become clear. And then very awkward line that I felt uncomfortable with. He's going... And as the eldest, can you not help him to try to understand what it means to grow up a woman? I got uncomfortable. Yeah, oh, okay. that's true. <laughs> I got uncomfortable. Oh, my. Oh, dear. Soldier, hmm. shut up. You're not helping. That was just an awkward line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't like that. And then he said something like, oh, she goes, you shouldn't meddle in family affairs because she was opening up to him. And then she's kind of going, wait, you're kind of going over the line here, buddy. This is mm -hmm. you private <laughs> family matters. And he goes, well, I'm I'm going to be the king's son-in-law. And she's going, OK, that's it. We're done here. <laughs> And then Peter Weller gets stuck with the line that has never, ever worked in the history of men trying to calm women down. He says, calm down, calm down. <laughs> yeah, that never works. It's never, ever, ever worked. <laughs> that will just make me more mad. Yeah. To our male listeners, be forewarned. That will never, ever work. It never has. It never will. <laughs> no. So she goes off in a huff. So she's ticked at him, but you kind of still feel the chemistry there. And it was the that, first lover spot. Oh, that's a good. That is a beautiful way of putting it, Melina. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> <laughs> and right. Like you said, then we go back and it's the next night of dancing. And they're all in the same colors. Again, they're all wearing like Loretta's wearing the green, that same shade of green. And like the yellows and the peaches, it's all the same colors, which I thought they was all have like their own had signature kept that. colors. Yeah. So I kind of like that. Had they kept that consistent? Oh, I can do this. Janetta is in green. Winetta is in yellow. Coretta, Donetta are in pink. Musetta is in blue. And Loretta is in orange. There you I go. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody ask me to do that? No. <laughs> Wow, I'm a dork. And then, of course, <laughs> and then, of course, in this scene, he takes another prize because for the first time he went, he got a branch. And this right. one, he gets a goblet that he accidentally smokes her in the nose with. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is another difference from the English version of the tale. So, what happens there is, like I said, he's got a thing for the youngest, and he actually lets her know that he knows. And he does it by taking twigs off the first, it's a silver branch. And then he does the gold branch. He's a gardener. So it's his job to give the princesses bouquets every morning. And he sneaks the silver branch into her bouquet. One day he sneaks the gold branch into it the next day. So he lets her know he knows, but she also knows that he's not going to her father. And she kind of thinks he's cute and everything, but she tries to bribe him says, I know, you know, our secret. I don't know how, you know, but here's some gold coins keep for your silence and he refuses the money and then she knows he knows and finally she tells her older sisters and they're going well this is a liability we can't have someone know even if he's not told her dad yet so we should just have him thrown in the tower because that's how you solve things back then when people knew stuff you did dang and the youngest princess who likes him she has an issue with this and she's going hey he hasn't ratted us out yet so i don't see what harm it's doing for him to know he doesn't need to go 
into the tower. So they come up with a compromise, which is, well, we'll just drug him like we do our suitors and he can just be one of our dance partners, which the youngest princess kind of goes along with. But the gardener, he has the invisible cloak. He overheard the whole conversation and he had actually decided to let them drug him. He was going to sacrifice himself because the youngest loved dancing more than anything. And he's like, if this will make her happy, okay, because I know she wouldn't be happy being a gardener's wife. So he agrees to let himself be drugged. And right when he's holding up the jeweled goblet and he looks her in the eye, she goes, no, I'd rather be married to a gardener and throws the goblet away. And that breaks the curse. So they all kind of go up together and all the princes are suddenly freed from their curse too. So they all go up together. So it is a happy ending in that version, but it is extremely different. But that's the significance of the tree branch and the jeweled goblet. That's straight out of the English version. I see. Yeah, in the German version, it's a goblet as well. It's three branches and a golden goblet. Oh, we have Janetta at breakfast and she's got a cute little X over her nose, which (laughs) I don't see. From where he smoked her. Yeah, I don't see how that little X over the nose is doing any medicinal help. Uh, it, it looked funny. So. It did. Oh, can we also mention how after he smokes her with the goblet, he falls into the water and then the oh, cloak yeah. falls off. You're right. And then he catches a cold from being in the water for like two seconds. <laughs> That's how he caught the cold. And then he starts to sneeze and they all think it's a bear. Because <laughs> that makes sense. Right. Okay. Because there are bears in your mysterious underground enchanted kingdom. And then when you discover him, they go, sisters, behold your bear. I love that. Which took me a little while to figure out what she meant. (laughs) I remember when I was rewatching this the other night, I was like, because when I hear bear, I immediately go to the gay reference. And I was like, ha. Oh, Oh, I didn't go there. (laughs) About like, yeah, I know some bears. So I, that's my mind just went and also being oh, gay actually, myself, so my I. mind just like I... immediately went there. <laughs> wow. No, I hadn't. That was not where my mind went, but I could see that. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what they meant at all. But see, anyways, I... but yeah, I love the breakfast. Yeah. When I was a kid, I love that breakfast was, scene. Behold your bear. I wasn't thinking in terms of they thought it was a bear the previous night. Behold your bear. I'm like, does that mean behold your burden? I was thinking like bear, like bearing. Uh. I I see. Yeah, I was very confused about that line until years later when I rewatched it and I'm going, oh, no, they thought he was a bear. That's what she meant. It's a problem with the term. Lions and tigers and bears. Yeah, that's the problem with that word having so many different meanings. And the whole night Loretta's, I feel. She has a little whole night. Yeah, Yeah. it's like that in the German version, too. It's the youngest sister. Something's weird. And you know what? Hmm? Kudos to Loretta because she's. The one who knows, she was right the whole time and everyone made fun of her. Good intuition. She had a cute little flirtatious moment with Peter Weller when she was playing checkers. I thought that was well acted. She's like, you think I'm pretty? Well, would you pick me to marry? Good girl. You... That took some balls. Good for you. Right. No beating around the bush. Just like so. (laughs) Hey, no surprises. And he leveled with her. He's like, yeah, I think you're pretty, but I think I'm a bit old for you. So, hey, he let her down easy. That's the the kid sister has a crush on me. And that's flattering. But I'm not into the kid sister. He did it very respectful. Yeah. Yeah, he did. But I love it. The next scene at breakfast, how he literally comes walking out carrying the cloak and then has this canker chief and then kind of just sits down in his nutcracker uniform, drops the cloak (laughs) on the ground. Looking very spiffy and clean and nice. Oh, yeah. That that uniform that was covered in dirt sure cleaned up nice. And now all of a sudden it's silver and Mm -hmm. bit polished. And hey, daddy. (laughs) (laughs) He knows he's running this joint now. He's calling the shots. Exactly. (laughs) And then eventually he sits down. He wastes no time. No time. None at all. None at all. I wonder if if he was like, the secret's eating me alive. I got to get it out now. Or if it was more of like, this will be fun. Let's cause some drama. I think he's more, I don't care anymore. I own this place. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. I mean, he knew he won at that point. So. Exactly. So he's like, no, I'm not going to play games. Uh, I'm going to put Janetta out of her misery and let her know she does get to marry me. <laughs> 
And I love, but the I love how they all stand up. Oh the, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was a, I wrote down, it was a really well-directed, sharply directed scene because mm-hmm. all of the sisters react at the same time with the same reaction. Sure. I know where they are. And they all drop their forks and then says they dance with six princes under the ground and they all stand up and go, <gasps> is that true? Loretta? Yeah. Then he does the roll call. Is that a- <laughs> And they all sit down as he says their name. It was so, so sharply directed. It was funny, but it was also kind of a little dramatic. I thought that was very, very well done. I wonder if they were able to do that in one take, <laughs> be in unison. I'll bet they did, but I bet they had a lot of rehearsals. Mm. <laughs> or maybe not. And then he presents the artifacts that he found. Artifacts. I love how the branch just clearly looks like it's been spray painted. I know. <laughs> cheesy i get it was low budget though so i'm willing to let it slide it worked the point was made and then none of the girls deny it and janetta gives an Mm -hmm. explanation which isn't really much of an explanation what the soldier is saying is true father we go dancing at night in a dream world come true how is that explaining anything it's not (laughs) okay not just me so we still don't quite know how this happened what started it how they discovered it how they first discovered this yes thank you that's a question i'm like too like how did you just know that there's a hidden world Uh, yeah Yeah, that's left unanswered but anyway there's a sweet little monologue by roy daughtry's that just pulled at my heartstrings. I know he was the father of two daughters. Michelle Daughtry's and Karen Daughtry's are his daughters. Everyone remembers Karen Daughtry's from Mary Poppins. That's his daughter. And I just... Oh my God! We can, we can always count on Emily to have all the random... <laughs> Hollywood connections and trivia. Yep. Oh, wait. Well, I'm so glad I'm sitting down right now because like my mind is blown. Oh, I never put that together. Yeah. And yeah. I have a freaking Karen, Mary Poppins. Karen tattoo. Daughtry's from Mary Poppins. That's Roy Daughtry's daughter. Yep. Anyways. So what struck me when I was rewatching this earlier today, it was a little monologue. I suppose I was trying to cling on to the happy memories when you were little girls and um, your mother was still with us. She always knew what to do. But um, being a father alone, trying to raise daughters, it's, it's not an easy task. So many things to consider. So many things can go wrong. And I was just thinking, he's got two daughters, and I really hope they got a chance at some point to see this. Or if any of them are listening, check it out. Your dad just really pulled at my heartstrings here because it really seemed so from the heart, so genuine. Like, yeah, I'm a dad. I've got little girls that I'm responsible for. And it's scary. I love that. I thought it was such a sweet moment. Very well acted by a very great actor. So wanted to mention that. And then does it come to the moment where it is really cute? Which one do you want to? And then he immediately is kind of like, which one do you want to marry? He's like Janetta. He's like Janetta because she's the oldest. oldest. And And then slight pause. And she stands up and goes, well, don't do me any favors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then oh, he great. goes, Which and I, because right I fall over my in love head as a kid, I did not care. Yeah. I'm like, what? What does she mean by that? And now the older I get, I go, yeah, girl's got a point there. <laughs> and I love how they fell in love with each other over the course of three days. And half of that time <laughs> he was pretending to be passed out. Oh, have you seen Cinderella? <laughs> Yeah, at least you got you three days. Any of Cinderella them? had like 30 minutes. <laughs> or Snow White three. had just gotten out of a coma. That's a fairy tale. I'd argue that Janetta and the soldier had a more stable <laughs> relationship built up than some of the other. I mean, they knew True. they were going to spar. They, they knew they were going to spar, but they also knew they were equally matched and mutually respected each other. And then he just, I'm totally with Janetta on this one. Oh, you'd pick me because I'm the oldest. Well, don't do me any favors. And then he's going, no, it's because I fell in love. And I've fallen, and I've fallen madly in love with her, sir. Yeah. And Aww. yeah, all the sisters <laughs> are going, <laughs> and then, and then he, he asked her, he asked yeah, her, he Janetta, asks will you her. marry me? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I wrote down. I'm going, he gives her the choice yeah. to back out. He won the game, but he said, if she doesn't want to marry me, she doesn't have to. So Aww. 
I mean, how often does that happen in our fairy tales? I mean, yeah, because he could have married her either way. That was it. Yeah. He gave her the chance to say no. That was, I mean, that, that just, yeah, that was sweet. Melted my heart. You know, it probably didn't hurt that all five of her sisters are going, well, if you say no, you idiot, I'm in love. (laughs) She was like, they're all like, say yes, say yes. Yes. But you really got the feeling that if she said no, then Musetta would be going, and here's my number. And Loretta would be going, or me, (laughs) play checkers. (laughs) They all had crushes on him. It's like The Bachelor, like you said. And then I love when they go into kiss, or is it after they kiss and he sneezes again, or he starts coughing. Just adds a little. And she dabs his nose with her kerchief. Yeah, she goes off. Stop. Like, <laughs> these two are so meant to be. They're so meant to be. They are be. really cute together. And then we get the music swelling and then we get the last shot, which is their wedding. And he's in full dress uniform looking like the Nutcracker. <laughs> and he's got his handlebar mustache very nicely greased. He, t- he took a <laughs> bath. So he doesn't have all that spray tan on him. <laughs> oh my God. It's so true. I was like, where did you come from? Jersey Shore? Like, like tone it down. <laughs> And the old woman is back somehow. The cobbler is invited to the wedding. Actually, I could see the cobbler being invited to the wedding. That I could see. But how'd they find the old woman? I don't know. Well, if she's magic, then I don't know. Maybe she, maybe she knew all that stuff because maybe she's from the magic land. I don't know. Yeah, and she wanted to get the princesses out of there so she could dance with the magic princess herself. There you go. <laughs> Ridiculous. Okay, so that's the end of our recap takeaways. How would you rate this episode on a scale of one to 10? Eric, I'm going to have you go first. I would say a solid nine. That's exactly where I am, actually. <laughs> because it's, I always said this, it's like one of my top, I would say top three. I say top five, but I would even say, I would dare to say top three because it's very, very good. It's very solid. It gives you everything you want from fairy tale theater. It gives you the romance. It gives you the magic. It gives you really funny moments. It gives you beautiful moments. It gives you a beautiful score. It gives you an amazing cast. Like it gives you everything you want. So I agree. there it is. I completely <laughs> agree. Melina, what about you? Yeah, I would say like, yeah, eight, nine. Again, I think the sets and the costumes and the music, especially. I also just love the chemistry between not only Janetta and the soldier, but also between all of the sisters. You could feel like a bond between them. That's a and good I point. also and I think that's also really important to have chemistry between people playing family. It had just the right amount of humor as well as fantasy and love. And I think it was a good last hurrah. I think it was a really good choice for the last one. And the casting was excellent it was spot on yeah what i also love about the casting is so peter weller was in buckaroo bonsai and so was ellen barkin who was in princess who never laughed yeah peter weller i don't think i saw robocop until i was a bit older so i always associated him as the soldier not robocop but it was such a perfectly cast episode and it was a big cast i think this is one of the largest truly ensemble pieces and every single actress who played a princess got a good role i don't think leslie ann warren really outshone the others which is a big compliment everyone got their moment from you know max wright being the prince of upa winba to <laughs> zelda rubenstein just having her short little scene i feel like everyone got their moment their place in the sun there and the music was gorgeous the costumes were gorgeous like you said it was a great last hurrah so i am also at a nine out of ten for this one and it's just like it's so above and beyond the other episodes we had costume changes we had scenery changes we had that's a good i feel it's just like let's plot all the stops for this last episode that's a good point like you think back where it started with frog prince and terry gar had all of one outfit I think the only other episode that really had some good costume changes was Cinderella, but then it was plot driven. Good costume changes though. Were they all good? Oh, oh wait, no, I'll, no, I will backtrack on that. (laughs) No, I'll, all the costumes still had a touch of the eighties. Emperor's (laughs) the eighties were a lot. No, I'll give you this one. Emperor's new clothes had the best costumes. 
Yes. Fight me. Fight me on that. <laughs> You're right. But in terms of how fairy tale theater, like poor Terry Gar, who only had one outfit the whole show. I think Sleeping Beauty, the princess only had one outfit. It was nice to see that there were six whole princesses that they had to dress and they dressed all six beautifully and they all got a couple changes. So that's nice. Even at her wedding, Terry Gar, yeah. she had the same <laughs> outfit at her wedding, just a veil. Yep. I was like, I can't. I'm they done. Just, yep. <laughs> Okay. But it was the pilot. It was the pilot. They were still figuring some things out. <laughs> so who wants to embarrass me and read the review I wrote back in the day? Oh, you know, it's my favorite. <laughs> yes, Eric's favorite part. <laughs> to, our, to our listeners who are just joining us, I made a fairy tale theater website back in the early 90s. And I wrote reviews for every single one of the episodes. So you are about to hear what, I don't know, 16-year-old me had to say about this episode. <laughs> so your standout quote was, one man's problem is another man's good fortune. Oh, I like that. And then you wrote, the last episode of Fairy Tale Theater is certainly one of its best. The story of the dancing princesses lends itself beautifully to the screen. Roy Dotrice is charming as the father of six beautiful princesses. He simply cannot understand. For some reason, they all wear out their dancing slippers overnight and require new ones every morning. The king is at a complete loss and hires retired soldier Peter Weller to investigate. What he finds is a fairy tale in every sense of the word. Performance-wise, this is the best ensemble piece in the entire series. All the six princesses reduced from 12 in the original tale are lovely and charming. Leslie Ann Warren sparkles as the eldest daughter, Janetta. Sachi Parker nearly steals the show as the youngest, Loretta. Yes, all the princesses' names rhyme. (laughs) <laughs> Ian Abercrombie has a delightful role as a much put upon royal cobbler. And last but not least, Zelda Rubenstein has a cameo as a mysterious old woman. This tale succeeds on several levels. The plot is interesting. The character is well-developed. The sets and costumes are beautiful. But the real key to this series is the actors. They all worked extremely well together and had great chemistry. Warren and Weller brought a real element of romance to the story, which makes me watch it over and over again. Oh. And you gave it four stars. You know what? I, I stand behind pretty much all of that. A lot of that is kind of stuff I've said tonight about how it's such an ensemble piece and the costumes and this. Wow. This one wasn't that embarrassing. Yeah, I, I like that one. <laughs> I was going to say, your opinion has not changed. It really hasn't. <laughs> I guess my last question is always going forward. Is there anything from this episode that you intend to learn more about an actor or source material? Any takeaways? So Melina? I think the one thing about this show that I always want to know is I always want to know how Shelly chose the people she cast and how she got them to say yes. I know a big factor for a lot of them was like, think of your kids, (laughs) do it for your kids. So I'm always like, what what was her like love? sell them on it I got more the impression of she was just asking her buddies at first and then they asked their buddies especially the first two years you can connect pretty much all of them to Shelly somehow and then oh my god it's a game it's the best game to play it is yeah it's like six degrees of Shelly they all somehow knew Shelly or well that's how she got Chris Reed for example she had never worked with him but she knew Robin really well and Robin and Chris were BFFs and roommates in college that's how she got Chris Reed so Mm -hmm. I I think I feel like like the later seasons I feel like were more fun they were easier for people to cast because well they were like oh this looks fun yeah that's actually the exact same thing that happened with the Muppet show where mm-hmm. apparently Jim Henson had real trouble getting guest hosts the first season. He was calling in every favor he knew. <laughs> and then apparently once the first season aired, people were calling him going, can I dance with Miss Piggy? <laughs> I think that's probably what happened with Fairy Tale Theater. She just started with calling her friends and then her friends of friends. And then people were calling her. I think that's probably what it was. I love that. But I yeah, never got the impression she really had to twist people's arms because I think a lot of them wanted to play dress up. <laughs> oh my God. That was what Pam Dauber said too. She's like, it was like playing dress up. See? <laughs> Smart woman from Michigan. Is she actually? Oh my God. Yeah. Of course. She's from of Farmington course. Hills, Michigan. <laughs> well, guys, this was lovely. Yeah. This was a blast, guys. 
Well, thanks for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for Welcome to Tonight's Tale. And we'll see you next time. Until then, happily ever after. Good night. Good night. night.